All right, welcome to chapter 12, the lymphatic system and body defenses. Um, uh, the lymphatic system is one of those systems that we oftentimes overlook and we think is insignificant. Um, however, the lymphatic system is vital to our survival as with most other systems in the body, but um, don't discount the importance of the lymphatic system um, because it serves a major role in preventing infection and all that kind of bad stuff that can happen to our bodies. So that's what we're going to focus on today. We'll talk about the lymphatic system and then we'll talk about some specific body defenses. Um, uh, though we'll talk about those specific defenses. Um, not going to get real crazy in depth about those. Mainly want you to be familiar with them and at usually at later times during your studies um, when you start to get into more program specific things you'll talk a little bit more about these um, and that's when you'll start to dig a little bit deeper in them, okay? So, uh, lymphatic system is, what, is part one of the lecture today, and, and we should get through both parts in a reasonable amount of time, probably a little over an hour. Um, this, uh, the lymphatic system basically consists of two semi-independent parts. They kind of work independent from each other, but they really kind of work together too. Uh, we have the lymphatic vessels and lymphatic tissues and organs. Um, the functions of the lymphatic system is to transport escaped fluids back into the blood um, and it also plays a role in body defenses and resistance to disease and those kinds of things. Um, remember when we were talking about the vessels in the body, the arteries and veins and when, it, when we got all the way down to that capillary level, how the pressure of the blood going through those veins actually forced fluids out of the veins and into the tissues. Some of those fluids were recollected but we forced um, n nourishments and oxygen and all those kinds of things, those essential things out of the veins and reabsorb some waste products. But a lot of that fluid, or not a lot of it, but some of that fluid isn't reclaimed by those vessels just because of the way that those vessels work off of that osmotic pressure um, on the return side. It, you know, it's, it's actually hydrostatic pressure or the pressure of the blood going through the veins that pushes those fluids out but it's osmotic pressure that brings it back in. So that doesn't recapture all of those fluids. The lymphatic system, um, its function is to recapture some of those fluids from the capillary level and return it back to the blood. Um, so what our body's uniquely made in the fact that it uses this return system to its advantage um, by running this fluid back through these lymphatic organs and lymphatic tissues, it can sense if there's an infection going on or some substances that don't belong and it can begin to signal the body to respond to that. So that's the role of the lymphatic system, vitally important in uh, uh, protecting us from infection. So that excess fluid that, um, that I was talking about, we oftentimes refer to that as lymph when it is in the lymphatic system. Outside of the lymphatic system, usually it's just plasma. Um, but the lymph, lymph consists of fluid and some plasma proteins. And that is uh, inside those lymphatic vessels. Um, if uh, the lymphatic system doesn't pick up these fluids, um, we'll start to have some edema or some swelling, basically some water buildup. If you've ever um, been on your feet for a long time and got home and noticed that your ankles were swollen, um, and you had some fluid built up in there. And edema is one of those things that you'll talk about a whole lot more specifically um, once you're into your chosen career path. There can be numerous causes of edema. This is just one of them, but if the lymphatic system fails to pick up those fluids, we'll see those fluids in the extremities. We see it most prevalent in the, in the lower limbs um, as fluid. Um, and we call that edema as that fluid buildup. So, um, if they uh, that are, when working properly, they're going to pick up that excess fluid. Once it's in the lymphatic system, it's called lymph, um, and then they're going to return it back to the blood. Um, it's just an alternative way of returning those fluids back into the circulatory system um, while still trying to detect if something's going on. So, um, but remember, the cause of edema is not always because fluids aren't being re-picked up by the lymphatic system, though it could be that, um, but that may not be the only cause uh, as to why that's happening. Um, 
uh, but that can cause a whole host of other problems, which we won't get into here. But when you're talking about other disease processes later, you'll, you'll learn a lot more about edema. So we have this lymphatic system, and this is just a very generic look at it, obviously. Um, but we get all the way down to the capillary level, and you can see those little green vessels down there that are in close proximity to the capillaries. Uh, what they do is they pick up those excess fluids that were forced out of the blood vessels by the blood pressure and not returned back into the venous side um, because there wasn't enough or, uh, there wasn't enough um, osmotic pressure to pull it back in. Uh, and so this fluid just kind of gets stuck out there in no man's land. Well, the lymphatic system picks that up, picks that fluid up um, and pulls it in through there. Um, and along the way, you can see the little some of the little nodules on that um, that are valves. Um, and those valves work much like the valves in the venous system um, uh, to keep the lymph only from move, uh, keep the lymph moving one direction um, and keep it from back flowing. Um, and of course, along the way, we have the big nodules in there that are called the lymph nodes, and you've probably heard about those lymph nodes. There's some special things that go on in those as well, and we'll talk about those more in depth here in just a little bit, okay? So, lymphatic vessels, oftentimes we just refer to them as lymphatics. Um, it's a one-way system that moves towards the heart with valves and all that stuff in there that kind of keep things moving that direction. Um, much like the cardiovascular system um, of arteries and veins, we have a lymph system um, but that lymph system is kind of a one-way system. It doesn't circulate all the way. I mean, it, it, it's only a return system. It's not a, a system that's actually putting things out. It's only returning things. Um, so down there at the arterial and venule capillaries, where those two meet, where arteries and veins meet at the capillaries, we have lymphatic capillaries there. And they weave in between the cells, the tissue cells and the blood capillaries. Um, and they have these little flap-like mini valves at the end of them so that fluid can leak into the lymphatic capillaries. Um, and uh, it, part of this is caused by the higher pressure inside of the, uh, well, once the lymph gets inside of the capillaries, uh, pressure inside of there kind of closes those little valves to keep the fluid from going out the wrong direction. Um, and then fluid is actually pushed along the lymphatic vessels. So we see how they're kind of interwoven in here. It's, it's represented by the green there is the lymphatics. Um, and we see how they're interwoven in there. And then we'll take a closer look at the end of one of these lymphatics to see that one, that little flaps, the little valves on the end of those. Um, it's got these little filaments that actually hold those flaps to connective tissue that can kind of pull them open as the tissue swells with uh, fluids. It pulls those flaps open and as the as the fluids go into the lymphatics and out of the tissues, those little flaps or the, the uh, filaments actually allow the flap to close. Um, so the more fluids in there, the more the flaps are open, the less fluid that's in the tissues, the, the more the flaps are gonna start to close. And that's how they fill up with this fluid. Um, and it keeps the, the, uh, the lymphatic vessels from leaking that back out. Basically, that lymphatic vessel there, the more fluid it has in it, the more puffed up it is and the more it pushes against the valves and pushes them closed. And as that shrinks up, those filaments that hold out to the connective tissue, as the vessel shrinks up, it pulls, it keeps, it pulls the flaps open because it, it, the, where the flaps are attached with those filaments, it can't shrink back, so it holds the flaps open. That fills up with fluid, and the more fluid that fills it up, the more the valves close or the flaps close. Um, and then uh, it's full and it's going to start moving those, the fluids up and through. Um, all that happens relatively quickly. It's not something that's a really slow thing, but it, remember it doesn't happen as quickly as kind of the heart does. You know, the blood vessels, you know, move circulating blood. It's a slower process than that, but it's very similar. So these collecting vessels collect the lymph from the capillaries, um, from the, the uh, lymph capillaries. It carries it, uh, and they also carry lymph towards and away from the lymph nodes, the big nodes that we're going to talk about here in a minute. Um, and they're going to return the fluid to the circular veins near the heart. Um, and then, of course, the right lymphatic duct drains into the right arm on the right side of the head and the thorax and the, 
thoracic duct drains into lymph from the rest of the body. So um, it does have a return system, but it returns it into the uh, veins and not into the arteries because the veins are lower pressure. Um, it can return them into the veins. If it tried to return them into the arteries, it would actually push blood into the lymphatic vessels, which would not be good. That's not what we want. So um, looking at the lymphatic vessels and the, in, in the body, um, you might be surprised to learn how many there are. Um, there's a lot of lymphatic vessels, but there's not a whole lot. There, well, there actually is a lot of nodes too, sorry. Um, so there's a lot of vessels, a lot of nodes. Um, uh, most people are surprised to see how, how, uh, how many of these that there are um, throughout the body. Once again, uh, return, it's part of the return system for those excess fluids and part of our defense system for both. Um, lymphatic vessels are similar to the veins of the cardiovascular system. They're thin-walled. Um, the larger vessels have valves in them. It's a low-pressure system without a pump. Um, of course, transport of lymph is aided by um, the kind of that same milking action that skeletal muscles have for veins. Um, that helps to move the lymph along as well. Um, and of course, pressure changes caused, you know, caused by breathing and the thorax and of course, and the smooth muscles within the walls of the lymphatics themselves kind of move that stuff along. So those things kind of move it around even though there's not a pump to actually move things. All right, um, one of the, the, or the main thing that the lymph nodes do, those nodules that are kind of sporadically throughout the body um, attached to the lymphatics, uh, these nodes help to filter the lymph before it's returned to the body. It's going to help kind of keep out some bad things, some harmful things, bacteria, viruses, viruses, cancer cells, cell debris, those types of things. And if they find any of those things in significant number, it'll actually trigger the immune system to kick in and start to combat the things that it finds. So it's a very helpful sense system. All right, there are some cells. Um, some vital cells that are located within the lymph nodes themselves, such as macrophages that can in ingest and engulf and destroy substances that don't belong, uh, bacteria, viruses, foreign cells. Um, these little guys are working all the time. Um, when they get overwhelmed, that's when we get sick or we begin to have an illness. Um, but as, if they can keep up, they prevent us from getting sick. So it's kind of, um, it's a good thing. Um, there's also lymphocytes which respond to foreign substances in the lymphatic system. Um, those are lymphatic cells that are defense mechanism cells, but they're located solely in the lymphatic system. Lymph nodes are kind of kidney shaped. Um, most of them are less than an inch long and are bur buried deeply in connective tissue. They have a cortex or an outer part that contains these follicles um, and the collections of lymphocytes. Um, and they, uh, the, the, in that cortex, there's some germinal centers that enlarge when antibodies are released by plasma. So when the doctor um, checks your um, glands in your neck, he's checking your lymph nodes. Um, when you're sick, you go to see him when you're sick, checks your lymph nodes, and what he's looking for is an enlargement that will show up in the germinal centers uh, of the cortex. Um, and that's there because the antibodies are releasing are released by the plasma cells and causing them to causing those nodes to enlarge, and then of course uh, we have the inner part which contains the uh, um, the phagocytic cells or macrophages um, that as uh, another weapon in the defense system of our body um, to keep us safe. Um, here's an example of it, uh, uh, and uh, you can kind of see how lymph kind of passes through those. So the goal of these are is to pass that lymph through there in such a way that if there is some foreign substances that don't belong, they get detected, hopefully destroyed before they're able to begin to cause or a lot of damage or wrecking havoc within the body um, uh, and, uh, and to protect us from being very, very ill. Um, absent our immune system that we have, we would not survive very long. The bacteria would, would take us over relatively quickly and we would not survive. Um, we can survive without lymph nodes. They can go in there and take out lymph nodes. They oftentimes do um, in some cancer patients, in some instances of cancer. I think, uh, I think when there is uh, like uterine cancer for, is one example, um, they'll go in and take out 
uh, certain lymph nodes um, just to be on the safe side in case they're harboring cancer. Um, lymph nodes oftentimes can harbor cancer and those cancer cells, in spite of all the defenses that the body has, may set up shop in a lymph node and produce more cancer cells that it then returns into the bloodstream that get into other parts of the body and begin to set up shop in those areas as well. Um, and that is oftentimes what is referred to as a cancer that is metastasized or has spread to other parts of the body. Um, a very, very difficult uh, type of cancer to get rid of once it's done that. So to prevent that from happening, to help prevent that from happening when they go in and they take either all or part of the uterus out, you know, trying to uh, get rid of the cancer, they'll take the lymph nodes out as well because they don't want any rogue cancer cells that may have escaped to be returned back and, be, and set up shop in the lymph nodes and then spread throughout the body. Um, so that's the risk. That's what we worry about with those. But we can survive without them. Um, so that lymph, it, like I said, it flows through the nodes. It, uh, it goes through the convex side through the afferent lymphatic vessels. Afferent, remember the afferent is the ones that's going towards. Um, efferent is going away. Flows through the number of the sinuses inside there. It exits through the efferent vessels. Um, because there are fewer efferent than there are afferent, um, the flow through there is slowed down. Um, it, it kind of allows a little bit of a backup to happen so that that fluid that's in there can be thoroughly inspected and making sure that there's nothing there that doesn't belong. There's some other organs uh, that are part of the lymphatic system and they contribute in various different ways. Uh, the spleen, the thymus, the tonsils, and then uh, priors, uh, priors, I don't know how you say that, priors patches. Um, and we see them located here throughout the body, but the priors patches are in the intestinal areas. Um, the, the appendix, um, now they're calling that part of the lymphatic system. Um, they, uh, though they're still not really sure what the use of the little doggone thing is, uh, they're pretty sure that it's part of the lymphatic system or at least a part of a system that was important to our survival at least at one point in time during our evolution um, or our adaption. Uh, uh, so something that we don't use so much anymore, uh, but it still exists. Uh, the spleen, located on the left side of the abdomen, filters blood. We've talked a little bit about the spleen before. Remember how it destroys worn out red blood cells? Um, some and, and during fetal development, it forms red blood cells. Uh, and it's a good blood reservoir, uh, as much as uh, a pint of blood in reserve in there. Um, now, it's not like it's just a big jug of blood setting in there. The blood is actually filtering through, so there's no just stagnant blood setting in there. Um, it's moving through there. It's constantly being replenished, but, but it is, there is a reservoir there that the body can utilize in, in times of need. Thymus located in the lower, in the throat, over uh, above the heart, lying on top of the heart. Um, it's mainly really active during childhood, and it produces some vital hormones um, that programs those lymphocytes. So it's really active in the early stages, and then those lymphocytes kind of move on, and they set up shop in the lymph nodes. Um, the tonsils are little masses of lymphoid tissue around the pharynx. Um, they trap and remove bacteria and foreign materials. Um, tonsillitis, of course, is caused by congestion with bacteria. So what the tonsils do is, is they, they uh, take samples of the incoming air and things that we are putting into our bodies. They take samples of those. Um, and if it detects bacteria or virus or those types of things, it can kind of trigger the immune system to kick in. It is an early warning system to our um, defense system. Uh, in the fact that it senses what's coming into the body. Now, we do have instances where those tonsils become so inflamed they no longer work and function properly. Um, those tonsils, are, are they're, they're, they have these folds in them that are very prone to bacteria, and depending upon how, we are, how we're made, how our genetics determine how that we're made, um, may determine whether or not uh, we're more prone to bacteria and we may need to have them doggone tonsils taken out. Um, Pyres patches w are found in the wall of the small intestine and appendix. They're similar to the tonsils in structure and they, they once again capture and destroy bacteria that it finds in the d intestine. 
kind of like the tonsils do. Um, it, we do have normal, normal bacteria, normal flora is what it's called, in the large and small intestines that's supposed to be there that keeps our body healthy. Um, I'm sure you've heard of, of, of those bacteria, the probiotics and that kind of stuff that they sell like crazy. Um, but it, there is actually good bacteria that's supposed to be present within our digestive tract. Um, sometimes we can take antibiotics for such a length of time that it begins to destroy the, back, the healthy bacteria as well. We start to have some digestive problems um, and we need to replace that. But the, uh, the Pryor's patches doesn't, probably doesn't really affect the good bacteria that belongs. It's just looking for the bad stuff. And then there's some mucus-associated lymphoid tissue, or malt, um, which uh, includes the tonsils, Pryor's patches, and other small accumulations of lymphoid tissue. Um, and these are just, uh, it's just a way to re reference those particular things and how they act to protect the respiratory and digestive tracts in our bodies. Um, okay, so on to part two. On to the part that starts to get a little bit confusing because we're going to talk about um, so many different types of cells and what they do and what their responsibility is. Um, be aware that I'm not going to get real crazy testing you on very specific details of what some of these things are. I want you to have a familiarity with it, um, but I, I don't want you to kill yourself on trying to remember what the exact thing that killer, you know, uh, killer T cells do or you know, that kind of thing. Um, just to have an idea of their origins and, and how, they, how they're created and, and uh, those things like that. So, uh, so generalities is really what I want you to be concerned with um, when it comes to this stuff because um, if you get bogged down really, really, really trying to memorize the other stuff, you're really going to miss the mark on some things that I think are more important. So, so just bear with me. Um, we'll, get, we'll get through this next part and hopefully, hopefully you haven't already pulled your hair out after reading about some of this stuff in the book, wondering how you're ever going to memorize all of it. Um, but uh, uh, rest assured, you'll do fine. So, part two, body's defenses. All right, so it's important that you realize that um, our bodies are in constant contact with bacteria, funguses, viruses, all kinds of really, really bad things um, that, can, uh, that can wreak havoc within our bodies. Um, in, in, inside of our bodies and even outside of our bodies. So the body has two defense systems for foreign materials that form the immune system. Um, so the two types of defense systems that we have are innate or non-specific systems and adaptive which are specific defense systems. So basically we have defense systems that are innate that will just kind of randomly attack anything that it doesn't think that belongs and then we have some adaptive, we have an adaptive system that is very specific. It recognizes something and it says, hey, I know you, I've met you before and you don't belong here. So it responds to those insults and deals with them. Immunity, when we talk about immunity, we're talking about specific resistances to disease. So when we talk about immunity, we're typically talking about adaptive body defense systems. So, okay. Um, so innate, like I said, it's nonspecific. Um, it's just these, uh, a variety of mechanisms that pr protect against all of these invaders. It can respond immediately to protect the body from foreign materials, but it is uh, very broad and random in what it does. It's not very specific and it may not be very effective. Adaptive, on the other hand, is very specific um, and is... Uh, and will respond to a very specific type of invader, um, and it is a little. It is much more effective. But between the two of them, they're very effective. If they're both healthy, they both work very well. Um, some of the innate defenses that we have are actually just nothing more than mechanical barriers to pathogens, such as our skin coverings, mucous membranes, um, and then some specialized human cells and some chemicals that are produced by the body. Um, some of those the sweat and the oils that are produced by our bodies that, that trap some of that bacteria and keep it from entering our, uh, entering in our body. Um, sometimes we even, we, we have the, those oils that are secreted by our bodies that trap bacteria. Sometimes they trap good bacteria or what the body considers as good bacteria. 
that can attack bad bacteria, so we intentionally use good bacteria to defend ourselves from bad bacteria. I know it seems odd and it seems contrary to probably what you know about the body um, or have known about the body, but um, the body can use good bacteria to our advantage in order to keep bad bacteria under control, and that's some of those chemicals help to do that. Okay? So, um, of course, those surface membrane barriers are our first line of defense, the skin, mucous membranes, those kinds of things help keep those um, bad bacteria, funguses, and all that stuff out. Um, so that's a very non-specific way of doing things um, to keep things out. There's also some secretions, like I said, um, that are toxic to bacteria, um, and so things don't survive. Um, the, in the stomach, uh, there's some secretions, of course, hydrochloric acid that kills a lot of pathogens. Hydrochloric acids also help break down the protein so we can digest things. Um, uh, saliva and lacrimal fluid um, contain lysome and, uh, and enzymes that destroy bacteria. And of course, there's some mucus that traps microorganisms in the digestive and respiratory tracts. Um, and I'm sure everybody listening has had a cold um, and they, have, they get this congestion and we always think it's just this drainage that's drained down in our chest. And a lot of times that it is. Um, but sometimes when we get sick and we've had this foreign invader, sometimes our lungs will actually produce some mucus as well that we wind up coughing up. And what it is is your lungs are producing this mucus because it's trying to trap this bacteria that it's, that's present there and then you're coughing because it's trying to get it out. It's trying to trap that bacteria and get it out of the body. Okay, so some of these cells, there's also some cells and chemicals that provide a second line of defense. There's some natural killer cells, which we'll talk about later. Um, there's this inflammatory response that the body has. We've talked about that just a little bit. Phagocytes, antimicrobial proteins. Fever is actually a good defense. Um, a lot of bacteria cannot survive at temperatures beyond a certain set point. So a fever is a body defense to try to destroy the bacteria. It doesn't always work. Um, it doesn't always affect the bacteria, and some bacteria actually thrive at harder, warmer temperatures. So. so natural killer cells, basically they self-lyse. They just kind of explode, um, and not really explode, but they just kind of fall apart and disintegrate and kill cancer cells and other virus-infected cells by releasing their contents close to them to kill them. So they just kill them. That's what they do. They're just, they're almost like the, um, uh, for lack of a better term, the, um, uh, the bomber that walks into a crowd of people and sets themselves off. Um, the, it's similar to what these cells do. Um, they may, very well may take some healthy cells with them, but the idea is to destroy the cells that are very, very harmful to the body. Um, they release a chemical called uh, uh, perforonin and that target the cell's membrane and nucleus causing disintegration. So it releases that, destroys the membrane and the nucleus of the, the affected cell um, in order to protect the other cells. Um, we also have an inflammatory response. Um, whenever we have tissues that are injured, and we can have tissues that are injured by physical forms of energy or injury, such as cuts and that kind of thing, but um, infections and those types of things can also injure them. Um, but this inflammatory response has uh, the four most common indicators that we typically see is redness, heat, swelling, and pain. What happens during this inflammatory response is it prevents the spread of damaging agents that may be present within that affected site. It gets rid of uh, cell debris and pathogens that may be present through phagocytosis, and then it creates an environment to where the, the repair process can begin. So the re inflammatory response happens kind of like this. We have an insult or an in injury that causes a chemical release of uh, uh, a release of chemicals in that area that triggers everything to kind of start to happen. We have some, uh, some neutrophils that migrate into the area of inflammation um, uh, by going along the vessel wall. They squeeze through the capillary walls 
and, uh, and then they, uh, they gather in the precise site of the tissue injury and consume any foreign material that's present. Even damaged, uh, can, even, can even deal with damaged cells while they're there. Um, during this inflammatory phase, basically what happens is we'll get some swelling in that area, some fluids will rush into that area, we'll have an increase in blood flow to that area, uh, which causes all the warmth and all the redness and all that kind of stuff, but it creates a wall. They wall off that environment, that, that area right there, in order to keep anything from escaping send all of these um, uh, bacterial killing and protecting things in there uh, to kill off any bad stuff and then allow the healing to start to take place. Um, and that's the inflammatory response. We also have some phagocytes, um, which are cells such as those neutrophils that we just talked about and macrophages that engulf that foreign material. Um, a vacuole, uh, is, uh, is fused with the lysome and then enzymes from the lysomes digest the material. So we'll have neutrophils and macrophages that engulf this material and they'll put it in a vacuole and then that vacuole is then brought over to a lysome to where that the enzymes inside of the lysome can digest the material that is caught by the neutrophils. So it's a, it's a, a symbiotic process of all of these little cells working together to, um, to destroy and rid the body of these things. So Here's a macrophage that has grabbed a hold of some bacteria. The macrophage is the purple thing in the middle. The bacteria are the green things on the side. So it's grabbed a hold of this bacteria. It's going to pull it into the cell. It's going to begin to destroy and digest it and create a, a, a phagocytic vesicle. And then the lysomes inside of that cell are going to bond with that vesicle inside of there and destroy the contents of that vesicle to the point that it's no longer harmful to the body and then release the debris out into the wild, so to speak. Okay, we also have some antimicrobial proteins there. They enhance the innate defenses by attacking microorganisms directly and hindering the reproduction of microorganisms. Um, the most important types of these are the complement proteins and the interferons. Complement proteins refers to a group of at least 20 plasma proteins. Um, they're activated when the plasma proteins encounter and attach to cells known as complement fixation. Um, uh, membrane attack complexes um, what is one result of complement fixation and some molecules released are vasodilators and chemotaxis chemicals and that kind of thing. So basically we have this group of 20 proteins that um, will attach themselves to cells um, and begin to deal with those cells. Um, uh, you can see here where they kind of attach uh, and they may create a pore um, that allow the fluids to uh, escape from that cell and the cell die. Um, uh, so these proteins just basically invade that cell and destroy it um, in one way or another. Interferons are secreted by virus infected cells. Um, they bind to a membrane receptor on healthy cell surfaces and interfere with the ability of the virus to multiply. So basically it's a way that the body can deal with viruses. The body doesn't deal with viruses really well. This is one of the few defenses that we have against viruses. Um, so interferons are very important in the fact that they can interfere with a cell's ability to replicate a virus. That's how viruses work. Viruses work by utilizing a cell to replicate more virus cells to spread to more cells. The problem is we can't destroy the cell to destroy the virus or we can't destroy the virus without destroying the cell. So one of the ways is with interferons the body can kind of deal with those. Um, the other way that we try to outside of this you know as uh, um, uh, through uh, chemistry and medications that we take, um, the goal, what we wind up doing is, is we try to destroy that virus while it's outside of the cell. So that virus gets inside of a cell, it replicates, and then it sends its offspring out outside of that cell to um, infect other cells. And while it's outside of that cell is when it's most vulnerable. Um, that is when we attack it, like uh, things like Tamiflu and those types of things. That's how those work, 
because the flu is a virus. So we put somebody on Tamiflu, their cells are already infected with the flu virus, but what we do is we try to shorten the length or the severity of the flu by giving them Tamiflu, which attacks the flu virus while it is outside of the cell. Inside of the cell, the cells that are infected are not, it can't stop that infection there. But what it can do is, is when it tries to send those offspring out to infect other cells, the Tamiflu destroys those virus cells that are present, the flu virus. Fever um, is a, uh, a systemic response to invasion of microorganisms. Um, the hypothalamus is the one that sets the thermostat higher. And the hope is that it's going to inhibit the release of iron and zinc, which is needed by bacteria. Um, and and it, will release, it will inhibit the release of that from the liver and the spleen. Um, fever also helps to speed up the repair process to a degree, but it can actually get to a point where it gets out of hand and can be dangerous. Um, all right, so the body has some, like I said, adaptive body defenses that are very specific um, and is our third line of defense. Um, the, uh, uh, the immune response is the immune system's response to a threat. So when we talk about the immune response, we're talking about the body's response to a threat. And the study of immunology or immunity is called immunology. Um, uh, so there is a specialty in this where we do have physicians that are immunologists, um, and that is what they do. They, they are experts in the field of uh, immunity and infection. Most of the time, these, these docs don't typically see patients all the time. Um, they may be primarily a research role, um, but some of them may see patients um, and, and uh, be working to correct immune system disorders with patients. Um, uh, antibodies are, of course, proteins that protect us from pathogens. This is where the terminology starts to get a little, uh, a little confusing. So antibodies means opposing, anti means against, and these are specialty proteins that protect from pathogens. Pathogens, we we'll need to think of pathogens as bad, antibodies as good. So try to remember that. So adaptive defenses has three things that we need to consider. Um, they can be antigen specific, which means it react, recognizes and acts against a particular foreign substance. Um, think of an antigen in much the same way as we think of a pathogen. Antigen, pathogen, try to think of them in similar ways as meaning they're both bad, okay? Um, they're also systemic. They're not restricted to the initial infection site. They can work anywhere in the body, anywhere. So they're systemic. They have a memory as well. They recognize and mount a stronger attack on previously encountered pathogens. Um, so they have the ability to go, we remember you. We remember that guy. If you've ever watched an episode of Cops and they go, hey, we've been to this guy's house 10 times and he's got guns and he's crazy and he does all that kind of stuff. We, we know. We've been here before. So they'll bring like 40 cops over there to capture this one guy because they know there's potential for a big fight and they need to mount a much stronger attack um, because they remember this guy from before. Um, now, the first time that they encountered this guy, it might have just been one cop. One cop that ran into him and, uh, and you know, it might not have went really great for that one cop and he might have had to call for help. But the rest, the next time they remembered him, they remember that guy. So they know next time they have to deal with him, they're going to bring a lot more of their friends, um, much like... Uh, uh, our body defenses, you know, work in much, much the same way. Okay? So, we have, uh, when we're talking about the adaptive or the specific body defenses, we can break that down into two more categories. Okay? So, we can further break that down into humoral immunity and cellular immunity. Humoral immunity is antibody mediated. It's provided by the antibodies present in body fluids. So um, it's just antibody mediated and cellular immunity is cellular mediated, which um, targets virus infected cells, cancer cells and cells uh, uh, from foreign grafts, you know, like um, organ transplants and that kind of thing. So one acts off of antibodies, meaning foreign substances like, um, oh, I don't know, uh, uh, foreign substances that may not 
that may not, maybe you're not supposed to be in the body, um, such as uh, uh, a, uh, uh, some bacteria. Uh, that would be antibody-mediated immunity uh, is that bacteria because it's, it's an antibody that's present in the body fluids. Um, or it's, yeah. And then if it's cellular, if it's a cell of something that doesn't belong, it's cellular immunity. Um, so those are the two different types. Antigen basically means non-self, so it's something that doesn't belong. Um, so any substance capable of exciting the immune system and provoking an immune response is called an antigen. Common antigens are uh, foreign proteins, nucleic acids, large carbohydrates, lipids, pollen grains, microorganisms, those types of things are can all considered an antigen. They're foreign substances. Um, there are some self-antigens um, that are recognized as that they belong. Remember, human cells have many surface proteins. We talked about this way back in, what, chapter 3 or something like that when we talked about those surface proteins that were basically markers that said, hey, look, this is what I am and this is where I belong. I actually belong in this body and I belong in this area. Remember that if, if we, could, we could have a cell from the liver, you know, you know, flowing by the capillaries in the big toe, and there's some macrophages or some um, uh, immune system cells down there that go, hey, look, you're a liver cell. You're a long way from home. You don't belong here, so I'm going to take care of you because you're in the wrong spot, and it'll destroy that cell. So recognizing cells that belong and don't belong is important. Um, because we don't want our immune cells to attack our own cells in our body. It does happen. There are diseases and, and, and uh, situations where this does happen, but we don't want that to happen. Um, now, if our cells wind up in another person's body, that can trigger an immune response because those proteins on the surface of that cell will be recognized as foreign. It's going to be, hey, that's Rusty's blood cell. It doesn't belong here or that's Rusty's liver cell, it doesn't belong in Curtis. Uh, so why, why is that in here? Well, it's recognized as foreign, and that's where we come into problems with blood, you know, our uh, organ transplants, um, because it's going to be, uh, it's going to cause a lot of issues. Now, there are ways that they can mitigate that with some medications, but first of all, you got to make sure that the organ is actually a match for that person at least in blood type and those and a few other things. Um, otherwise, it will just be rejected outright, you know, regardless of what medications you give them. Um, it still needs to fit some criteria um, in order for it to be a safe transplant. And then that person that receives that organ is going to be on medications that's going to suppress the immune system for the rest of their life because if we don't, it's going to recognize that those cells as foreign and it will destroy the entire transplanted organ. Um, in, in no time. Sometimes it does anyway. Sometimes the, the, it just rejects the organ, um, which is pretty sad when, you, uh, when it's a heart transplant or something like that, and uh, that it rejects the organ and there's no time to get another one and the person winds up dying in spite of all the efforts of the doctors and everybody that tried to save them. So, um, uh, so there, uh, there are many antigens. When we talk about antigens, sometimes there's a lot of small molecules called haptins or incomplete antigens, which are not completely antigenetic, uh, but they can link up with our own proteins. Um, when that happens, the immune system may recognize and respond to a protein-haptin combination and kick in a uh, an immune response. Usually this immune response is very harmful rather than protective because it attacks our own cells. You know, um, for example, someone that is allergic to uh, peanut butter, um, uh, it may fall along the lines of this type of a reaction because uh, it's those haptins that are kind of linking up with some proteins in our own body that are triggering this immune response um, and an exaggerated response that, that, uh, that needs to be treated. Um, the problem is, is the chemicals that these, uh, um, these cells, the rogue cells, or, and, the, and the immune system releases, you know, a, a lot of heparin and those kinds of things that thins out the blood and, you know, causes a lot of problems there. Uh, and, and it needs to be treated quickly, and we need to get that, that allergic reaction to stop in order to correct it. So, we have some cells. 
um, obviously, in the adaptive defense system, and we're just going to do a little bit of an overview of some of those cells. Um, some of the crucial ones in the adaptive system are lymphocytes. Um, these lymphocytes respond to specific antigens, meaning they don't just do things randomly. It, they require that um, identification system, and they're going to they're going to respond specifically to those things. So we've got B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes, um, commonly referred to as B cells and T cells. Now, those B cells and T cells can be further divided down into other forms of those, so just get ready. There's also some antigen presenting cells that help the lymphocytes, but don't, don't have a specific response themselves. Basically, it's the hall monitor of the immune system. It says, hey guys, over here, you need to come look at this guy. I don't think he belongs. So it's, it's a, or it'll grab somebody, or it'll grab not somebody, but it'll grab a cell and it'll bring it over to one of those T or T or B cells and go, here, look what I found. And they'll go, oh, thanks, buddy. We'll take care of that and take it off their hands. Um, so we do have some helper cells that do that stuff. So where do these lymphocytes come from? So they basically come from hematocytoblasts of bone marrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, big words. Um, T cells develop um, immunocompetence in the thymus and oversee cell-mediated immunity. So these T cells are actually, they start in the bone marrow, um, the, the ones that wind up making their well, way to the thymus become T cells, think T cells and thymus, okay? So they get their specialty in the thymus, they're, they're created in bone marrow, they go to the thymus, and then they're programmed, okay? B cells de develop their immunocompetence in the bone marrow themselves, so B cells, think bone marrow. So they're the ones that stay in the marrow, and that's where they get their specialization. Remember, theirs is the more, theirs is the humoral immunity. B cells have the humoral immunity, meaning they're going to recognize substances, bacteria, you know, uh, proteins, and those kinds of things that don't belong. Whereas uh, the T cells are going to be cellular. They're going to respond to rogue cells and that kind of thing that don't belong. So that's the difference between the T and the Bs. T is thymus and it's cellular. B is bone marrow and it is humoral. Okay. All right, and then these, once these immunocompetent lymphocytes are created, they seed themselves in the lymphoid organs where antigen challenge occurs, meaning where these antigens are gonna come in there and challenge these lymphocytes. And uh, of course, they also circulate through the blood, the lymph, and the lymphoid organs. Um, when we have an immunocompetent signaled by the appearance of an antigen-specific receptor on the surface of lymphocytes, that's when everything's going to kind of kick into play and get things going. These cells will begin to release chemicals and signals uh, so that surrounding uh, lymphocytes can kind of kick in and do their thing as well. So here's just a diagram of, of uh, we have those cells that are created, the immature lymphocytes. If they go to the thymus, they're T cells. If they stay in the bone marrow and get specialized, they're B cells. T cells are cellular, remember? B cells are humoral, okay? Then they go set up shop in the um, lymph nodes. Sorry. All right, so now we have these little antigen presenting cells, the APCs. Um, they will engulf antigens and then bring the fragments to the, to the surface where they can be recognized by T cells. So they'll engulf it and go, here, look what we found, uh, and the T cells will help out then. Um, many types of cells behave in this manner, such as dendritic cells, macrophages. Remember, we've talked about macrophages that engulf. Remember that big purple one that engulfs? Um, it'll, it'll present, once it engulfs in the, 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 the lysomes inside, destroy it and it kind of starts to spit it out, it, 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 it will signal the T cells that, hey, something's going on here. And of course, B lymphocytes do that as well, that will actually, B lymphocytes may trigger T cells to respond in kind. Um, B lymphocytes may, may find a virus floating around on its own and kick in the T, lymph, the T cells to start looking at cells that may contain that virus, which they're not very good at doing that. Um, when they present antigens, 
Dendritic cells and macrophages activate the T cells, which release chemicals that bring more T cells into the area and more um, uh, APCs into the area. Um, these macrophages arise from monocytes produced in bone marrow, so they're different than lymphocytes, okay, so they're monocytes, but they are part of the defense system. Um, they phagocytize pathogens, meaning they engulf them. Um, and they, they present the parts of those on their surfaces for the T cells to recognize. Uh, they're, they're, we'll find a lot of them in lymphoid organs, uh, and they s usually stay fixed in the lymphoid organs uh, is where they like to kind of set up shop. Um, they also secrete these proteins that help with the immune response as well. So when they're activated, they'll secrete some proteins that will bring more um, lymphocytes B cells, T cells, and that kind of stuff to that particular area where, where it's battling it out with them. Um, I like to think of uh, these cells, you know, they kind of get into a battle, you know, uh, kind of like a Braveheart kind of battle where they're fighting it out and, and they're kind of yelling out, calling for, calling for backup, so to speak, so more of their buddies can come in and help them battle the, the, uh, the horde that's trying to invade them, you know. Uh, so I, I like to think of kind of that's how they work. I don't know, maybe silly, but that's just me. Um, if you know me, you, you know that that's really not all that silly for me. Uh, so humoral is antibody-mediated immune responses, meaning it's, there's, a, there's an indicator, there's an, a recognition. Um, B lymphocytes with specific receptors bind to specific antigens. So remember, these are, this is not just random. These are not random responses. These are pre-programmed responses. These B lymphocytes have been pre-programmed to go, that antigen doesn't belong here. That bacteria, that virus, that um, pollen molecule doesn't belong here. Um, and you need to take care of it. Um, this event activates the lymphocyte to undergo colonial selection. And then, of course, a large number of clone, clones, a large number of clones are produced because of this response. So the B lymphocytes are going to just start creating more B lymphocytes like crazy in order to combat that. So we have a let's say we have a B lymphocyte that is very specific against ragweed pollen, right? So when we get ragweed pollen and we inhale it um, in our nose. All of a sudden, the B lymphocytes go, holy cow, it's that one B lymphocyte. Say there's 10 B lymphocytes right there, and that, that one little pollen molecule lands right in the middle of all 10 of them. But only one of those B lymphocytes is programmed with a receptor to recognize it. The other nine are going to go, hey, what's that thing? The 10th one's going to go, I know what that thing is, and I know what I need to do. I need to deal with it. So it's going to bind to a receptor on that lymphocyte, Activate that lymphocyte, and that lymphocyte is going to start to divide because it's going to need to. It thinks it needs to deal with a bunch of pollen, and it maybe it does. So it's going to divide so that it can deal with all of the pollen molecules that are present. Well, what does that do? It triggers other things to happen, especially in our sinuses, um, uh, when some of those things are recognized, or or when that pollen actually reaches the. Uh, and into the lymphatic system, it kind of triggers some other things to happen, and the body goes, hey, look, we got all this crazy ragweed pollen that's coming in the body through the nose, so we need to try to trap that and prevent it from affecting us. So then all this snot starts to come down, and, you know, it tries to trap that pollen, and it just, oh, things just go crazy, and, and before you know it, it, you're trying to sleep, and it's draining down your throat, and it's starting to get in your chest, and now that's that that thick mucus has trapped some bacteria in there and the bacteria has kind of started to grow because it's just not being well uh, prevented from the, you know, from the, you know, B cells aren't really working to get rid of that bacteria and the other immune system's not working really well. Now you're starting to kind of get down and sick and the bacteria is starting to take place. Well, before you know it, you got a sinus infection and, a, and an upper respiratory tract infection because of the daggum ragweed. Um, we've all probably been there. Maybe it's not ragweed for you. Maybe it's red cedar. Red cedar is a wonderful thing to be allergic to in Oklahoma because you can't, as I used, used to say, swing a dead cat. I don't know why. That sounds very disgusting and I you know, kind of feel sorry for the dead cat. But you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a cedar tree um, in Oklahoma, red cedar tree. 
So when them doggone things are pollinating, a lot of us are pretty miserable. It's very similar with ragweed, but that's kind of what's happening here. It's the bee lymphocytes that are responding to that stuff. So um, these bee lymphocytes then become plasma cells. They produce antibodies and destroy the antigens. And this usually lasts for four or five days. Um, very similar to what we see with an allergy response um, that sometimes we have to deal with for several days, even though they're telling us the pollen count is down. Sometimes it, our body's still battling. Some of these B cells have very long-lived memory cells um, that can mount a rapid attack against the same antigen in subsequent meetings, called a secondary humoral response. Um, these cells provide Im immunological memory. So um, this is a wonderful thing, um, and this is why sometimes we'll be exposed to an, aller you know, an allergen or a pollen or something like that. Um, and uh, the first time it kind of makes us a little sniffly and, and uh, kind of cold kind of feeling, but the second time, nothing. We don't even notice it um, because the B cells do such a good job, um, uh, that, which is very, very true. Sometimes we're exposed to something. Uh, chicken pox is a good example. Um, uh, uh, and I'm not sure that it's B cells. It's probably T cells that actually deal with chicken pox. But, um, but the body mounts a defense against that. So subsequent exposures to chicken pox don't affect us. And I know that's probably not a great example for B cells, but um, it's the best I can come up with on a short notice. So, so here's, here's kind of the cycle of those and how they, how they do their thing um, and become memory cells. Um, okay? All right. Uh, active and passive humoral immunity. Um, we're going to break down those B cells a little bit more. Active immunity occurs when B cells encounter antigens and produce antibodies, so that's active. Um, and this can be uh, naturally acquired during a bacterial and viral infection, so as we're exposed to something, we just naturally develop these antibodies that will combat that, or they can be artificially acquired from vaccinations. Um, we get all these doggone vaccinations as a kid, and uh, of course there's a, there's a lot of argument whether or not we should get those. Um, I, I haven't really decided which side of the fence that I fall on on that, but I do agree that we probably shouldn't give the little guys two or three or four shots in one meeting, in one session, um, that those probably should be spread out a little bit further, but then we run the risk of them getting extremely ill with something that might have been preventable um, while they're young. So, you know, that's, it's kind of tough when we have um, working parents that, that are unable to stay home with their children and they have to put them in daycare, which raises the risk. So um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of debate on vaccinations, but I can tell you this, vac vaccinations have saved billions of lives, um, and they're, they're, uh, they're, they're appropriate in many instances, um, but I think uh, maybe we should look at the ways that we're doing them. Passive immunity are those, uh, those things that we've acquired from somebody else, like the ones that we get from mom uh, when, when we're still developing inside of her, or the ones that we get from serum that was given to us. Actually, with moms, uh, nursing moms, that first, uh, um, the first milk that the baby gets when they first start nursing contains a lot of, uh, a lot of immunities that, they can, that, that the baby can gain passively. Yet again, a very good reason for, um, for babies to nurse. Um, there's a lot of uh, much greater benefits than that but that's just one of them. Um, and of course, we can get some artificially acquired ones, meaning we can have gamma globulin shots. Basically, they take the immunity uh, from somebody else and they inject it into you, and, and now you've got that immunity and you've gotten it passively. Um, but, the, and, but what it does is it creates that memory um, and it provides uh, uh, basically some borrowed antibodies from somebody else. Um, and then we've got non-colonial antibodies, which are uh, they're antibodies prepared for clinical testing and diagnostic services, produced, produced from descendants of a cell line. Um, uh, we use these. One of the ways, one of the things that we use for these is diagnosing pregnancy, um, and of course for treatment of exposure after hepatitis and rabies. I'm not real familiar with exactly how that works, but um, but they do use them for that. Okay, some. Uh, Antibodies, when we look at them more specifically, 
also called immunoglobulins or IGS um, when, you, when you see it abbreviated. These are soluble proteins secreted by synthesized B cells. So they're going to they're going to create these antibodies, then they're going to carry them in blood plasma, and they can bind to a specific antigen. So these B cells produce these antibodies and release them, and they they attach to antigens as they enter the body. It'll bind to those antigens. The structure of these is they have uh, a four amino acid chain. Um, too heavy, too light, no, blah, blah, blah. Um, each polypeptide chain has a variable and constant region. The regions of the antigen binding sites in one of each arm of the T or the Y, depending on the shape of them, um, the, those regions help to determine the antibody's function and the class that they're in. So, so we can further break down antibodies. Like most things that we've studied so far, we can get a whole lot deeper into these various topics and, and specifically into, into, into specific pieces and parts of them, um, but we're not going to do that. I'm not going to torture you with that stuff. So, so here we see uh, an example of an antibody and, and the binding sites are at the top and you can, they, they always kind of signify them with some sort of a shape and these are kind of a half moon shaped um, and that just means that it's going to bind with an anti antibody that is similar to that shape. So the antigen's gonna lock onto an antibody of similar shape and on their sites. Um, uh, or antigen, yeah, anyway. Um, antibody classes, of each class we have slightly different roles that differ structurally and functionally. So there's five, or five major immunoglobulin classes, and here all of them are. Um, and, it, and it goes into, you know, it tells us what each one does. Don't worry about that. Um, uh, um, the ones that you'll hear the most about are um, IG, IgG and IgE. Um, you'll see those referenced and you'll see those abbreviated um, sometimes in some of your other studies. Um, uh, so they inactivate, antibodies will inactivate these antigens in a number of ways. Um, they'll either through complement fixation, so they bind to them so that, that the, the antigen can't actually do anything or through neutralization. Um, they bind on the cells and, uh, and, and on sites of bacteria, um, exotoxins or virus that can, can, that can cause cell injury. So they bind to those sites so they can't, so they can't release the exotoxins or viruses that can cause the injury. Sometimes they'll cause agulation where these antibodies, um, antigen reaction that causes a clumping of cells that winds up killing the, the antigen. And of course, there may be some cross-linking reactions that it can cause. We can see those examples up here, um, how it can in inactivate those by just kind of making them to where that they can't work well. Um, the, the aggregation one is usually what we see with red blood cells, uh, and that's typically what happens with them. All right, so cell-mediated immune responses. Um, antigens must be presented by macrophages to an immunocompetent T cell. So these need to have um, the, the, uh, the macrophages present them with uh, an antigen that doesn't belong. That causes the T cells to become synthesized and then, by, then they'll bind simultaneously to a non-self antigen and a self protein um, displayed on the surface of the macrophage or other type of APC. Colonial selection occurs Clone membranes differentiate into effector T cells or memory T cells. Um, uh, so what happens is we have this T cell that's going to wind up differentiating into other cells that are capable of destroying that antigen that has been that is that has been recognized. So we have this. Um, uh, um, I can't think of the word now. We have a, this macrophage that actually that grabs a hold of this antigen, begins to engulf it, and show its, it shows its part to this helper T cell. And this helper T cell will differentiate, and it'll create um, a uh, uh, a killer T cell and a B cell that is capable of dealing with that particular antigen should it show its face again. So it's um, the T cells are going to clone, 
and this is where we get those cytotoxic T cells, um, and they specialize in killing infected cells, so they're going to kill other cells. Um, and they insert a toxic chemical into that cell that causes the cell membranes to fall apart and all of that. Where B cells actually come into this is the B cells, T cells are going to kill that um, cell if it has that antigen inside of that cell or on the surface of that cell. But if that antigen happens to be floating free, there's a B cell that can deal with that because the T cell can't deal with it when it's floating free and the B cell can't deal with it if it's in a cell. So that's why there's two types of cells that are created to deal with that particular antigen. These helper T cells actually recruit other cells to fight the invaders. They do interact directly with B cells and they release cytokines or chemicals that enhance the killing activity of the macrophages. So it helps the macrophages out. They attract other leukocytes into the area, stimulate B cells and T cells to grow and divide. So the helper cells, while they don't directly destroy the antigen that's present, they help with the division and programming of T cells and B cells and, and help the macrophages do their job and all that kind of thing. So it's a pretty complicated process, but it all works. Um, it's amazing how it, how it does work uh, the way that it does um, and that all of these things, uh, when they're working properly, um, fall into place. So, so then we've got some, some of these T cell clones, which are regulatory C uh, cells. They release chemicals to suppress the activity of T and B cells. So basically, these are going to be the guy that goes, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. You know, they're the referee that's going, all right, you got it under control. Calm down, settle down, um, go back to your corner. And they, they kind of stop that immune response and keep things from getting out of control. Um, and some of those members of each one of those have some memory cells. Okay? All right. I've talked about this just a little bit, and um, organ transplants and rejections are a huge problem. So even tissue grafts, where we, where we uh, maybe graft some skin or even bone from somebody else, um, can be a problem. Uh, the good news about tissue grafts, typically those are not as long of a process of having to um, take immunosuppressive drugs. Uh, you know, like skin graft or a bone graft or that kind of thing because eventually those cells are replaced with, you know, cells that belong uh, or it, it, the recognition gets there. The problem is, is with organs, you know, uh, heart, lungs, liver, that kind of stuff. Um, there are autografts, which are tissue transplanted from one site to another on the same person. Isografts from a person of identical, so if it's an identical twin, allografts, tissue taken from an unrelated person, it's the, usually the way that it goes, and xenografts taken from a different animal species. Um, but they're never, it says they're never successful, but actually they've used pig valves um, in people for heart valves. So uh, it's not entirely, but, but usually those don't have to take immunosuppressive drugs because that's not the same type of tissue. It's not a growing tissue. Um, so we have to have blood group and tissue matching to make sure that there's a best match as possible and that we will reduce the risk of organ rejection. Um, and then, of course, they have to be on immunosuppressive therapy for the rest of their life. Most of these organ replacements like heart, um, I, I think it was heart that they say is typically about 10 years um, is about all they're good for, and then you're going to need another heart. It's kind of sad um, that a young person might have to go through um, the anguish of waiting on a heart and a transplant and all that stuff uh, several times in their life. Um, but um, it, it, you know, it's often looked at it's better than the alternative. Um, at least they're, they're able to, to have a life. So we can have some disorders related to immunity just like every other body system. Um, usually we refer to them as autoimmune diseases, allergies, or immunodeficiencies. Um, one of the big ones that we have that we talk about is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS um, is one of those that's actually caused by a virus that invades the immune system and causes the immune system to no longer function properly and it's a very genius virus. This virus does this so that it can survive. Um, unfortunately, 
the virus winds up killing its own host over time, but the virus says, hey, look, if we have invade the immune system and prevent the immune system from responding and doing its job, we can survive in the body without being destroyed. Now, not every incidence of HIV, uh, um, the virus that causes AIDS, does it turn into AIDS. Um, not all of them do, many of them do, um, and, uh, and, and it can be quite, um, uh, quite difficult uh, of, a, of a disease to deal with or a virus to deal with. So, uh, autoimmune diseases basically is when the body's defense systems um, break down and the body produces antibodies or synthesized T cells that attack its own tissues. Most of these re result from the appearance of uh, uh, formerly, hidden, formerly hidden self antigens or changes to the structure of self antigen and antibodies formed against foreign antigens that resemble self antigens. So basically, we've had some sort of an invasion and the body has created an, uh, an, uh, an antibody for an antigen that it recognized, but it's very similar to tissues in the body and then it starts to recognize those tissues in the body as bad and um, begins destroying them or attacking them. Some examples, rheumatoid arthritis um, is one of the biggest examples of that where it begins to destroy the joints. Um, if you've ever seen anybody with the later stages of rheumatoid arthritis and what it does to their hands, it is, it is very sad. Uh, my, myasthenia gravis impairs communication between nerves and skeletal muscles. Uh, multiple sclerosis is the white matter of the brain and spinal cord is destroyed. Remember the white matter um, that is the myelinated um, uh, nerves begins to be destroyed. So it's the, the myelination over the nerves that is destroyed in multiple sclerosis. Graves' disease is a thyroid gland produces excess thyroxine um, that causes problems there. Uh, type 1 diabetes is... Uh, where pancreatic cells have been destroyed um, and those cells no longer produce insulin. Uh, they're making great strides in reversing that and correcting that. Um, still working on it though. Uh, lupus is another one of those that affects the kidney, heart, lung, and skin. It's usually a, a body-wide or system-wide um, uh, autoimmune problem. Um, I don't know if I can say this. Glomular... Glomular... Uh, glom or ulon ephritis, whatever it is. Um, um, it, it's, it's a nef form of nephritis where it, if, where it causes impairment of renal functions and it affects the kidneys. Allergies, of course, we've all got them. You know, we love them, right? Allergies or hypersensitivities are abnormal, uh, vigorous immune responses. So, um, our allergies, whenever we have an allergy, is where our immune response is kind of going a little bit overboard, a little over the top. Maybe those, uh, those uh, mediating T cells that are kind of supposed to, the clone cells or whatever it called them, um, aren't really kind of kicking in and telling everybody to settle down. They're just kind of letting them fight it out um, and things get a little bit crazy. Um, we, this can get severe though. I mean, most of the time are allergies, you know, it's just allergies, you know, you just got to kind of deal with it. But it can be very severe if we wind up overreacting or if our body overreacts to an otherwise harmless a agent, um, we can wind up with some tissue destruction. And this can go to the extreme where we have what's called an anaphylactic reaction, which is a severe allergic reaction that causes vessels to dilate, blood pressure to drop, blood thins out. Uh, cardiac arrest, those types of things, hives all over the body. Um, uh, it can be very, very severe, and if not treated immediately, very good chance it can be fatal as well. So that's those people that carry around an EpiPen. Sometimes that's not enough. Sometimes, despite all of our efforts, even if they're exposed to something, standing in the emergency room, um, it's, it's very possible that they could die from that anaphylactic reaction in spite of all the possibilities of what we have. So we can have allergens or allergies that have an immediate hypersensitivity, such as hay fever, hives, and anaphylaxis, due to the immunoglobulin E antibodies that are present, or it can be delayed, uh, such as contact dermatitis that reflects the activity of T cells, macrophages, and whatnot. Symptoms usually appear one to three days after the contact with the antigen. That delayed hypersensitivity might be something like poison ivy. Um, uh, 
many of you guys may not realize this, but not everybody is sensitive to poison ivy. I can walk through poison ivy, rub it on me, no big deal. It doesn't have any effect on me. If it does, if I do start to break out and get a little bit of dermatitis, um, usually uh, just a little bit of like a Benadryl cream or something like that in a couple of days and it's gone. Whereas my poor son and my oldest daughter, um, if, if they are downwind of um, poison ivy, they will be covered in it head to toe, going to the doctor, getting multiple steroid shots, taking oral steroids, trying to get rid of it. Um, so for some of us, it's, uh, we're very highly allergic to it, and for some of us, we're not, but that's that delayed hypersensitivity that it takes a little bit for it to kick in, okay? Immunodeficiencies result from abnormalities in the immune system. We talked about one of them, which was AIDS. Um, they, uh, they, the production or function of normal immune cells is hampered, and the, the, compl the com complement uh, becomes abnormal. It may be congenital. It may, you, maybe you were born with it, or it may be acquired. Um, there's, a, there's a severe combined immunodeficiency disease which is congenital, and of course, AIDS is acquired. Um, it's caused by a virus that damages the helper T cells. Um, as we're growing, as the body grows, the developmental aspects, lymphatic vessels form by budding off veins, and the uh, thymus and the spleen are the first lymphoid organs to appear in an embryo. Other lymphoid organs remain relatively undeveloped until after we're born, and the immune response begins to really develop around the time of birth, and then it grows exponentially for the first few years of our life and then kind of slows down depending on if, we're, if we stay living in the same area. Now, if you move, if you were a child that moved from place to place every year, every so many years to different geographical regions of the country or the world, perhaps your immune system was exposed to a lot more things. You might have been sick a little bit more, a little bit longer as a child but you, you very well may have an amazingly strong immune system because of all your exposure and your, your, uh, your body's immune system responses to develop pre-programmed immunities. Um, the body uh, also develops the ab ability of immunocompetent cells to recognize foreign antigens that becomes genetically determined. Um, stress does, however, appear to interfere with the normal immune response, so if you work in a high stress environment um, and you're exposed to those things that your immune system normally responds to, um, it very well could be that you wind up, instead of not getting sick, you wind up getting sick. You would think uh, nurses, paramedics, doctors, and all that stuff would be sick all the time because of their exposure. Um, I found that uh, they typically have a very strong immune system and they're rarely ill. Um, very few of my paramedic buddies that I worked with ever called in sick because they were sick with uh, something they caught, like the flu or those types of things. Now, I'll tell you this too, uh, nurses, paramedics, and all those, you always get one of them in every crowd that'll say, I never get the flu shot and I'm not going to because I've never got the flu. Well, that's true until the first time that they get the flu. I read an article about a paramedic that didn't ever get the flu shot. Um, and then one day he woke up in ICU. He had been there for seven days. Um, they said, I believe he died twice, basically crashed and, you know, and they resuscitated him twice, um, survived that incident, and has never missed a flu shot since then because it was the flu that about killed him. So lesson learned. Uh, try to learn those lessons whenever you can from somebody else and not have to figure them out on your own. It's always better. So pay attention to that kind of stuff um, and don't be that guy that we're talking about or that I'm talking about in my next lecture. So... All right, so the efficiency of the immune system starts to change or not get as good in old age. Infections, cancers, immunodeficiencies, and autoimmune diseases become more prevalent. And a way that we can combat this is to stay active. Um, staying active prevents a lot of older age related things, but our bodies are not designed to live forever. We're not immortal, um, unfortunately or fortunately, whichever way you want to look at it. So. Uh, Things are going to change as we get older, like it or not. Um, uh, they're just going to do that. All right? So that's chapter 12. We'll be back at chapter 13. We only got, what, four chapters to go, and we'll be at the end. 
All right, I'll see you guys on the next chapter.